Hi, um, I'm Jonathan Weber. I'm a longtime journalist here in town. I've covered uh, the tech business uh, on and off for many years, and Eric and I go back about 10 years, and I've been helping out a little bit on uh, all things newcomers. So very happy to be here and happy to be speaking with Matt Trotter, who was a Silicon Valley Bank veteran. And uh, you spent pretty much your whole career there, right? So the events of a year ago must have been quite dramatic for you. Tell us a little bit about the uh, about your experience on the on the day and the, the days of the of the crisis. Yeah, so I've been in venture banking about 18 years. Almost all of that was at SUB. Uh, I was there for kind of the bank run. So <clears throat> for us, you know, the morning started out on on of Thursday. We actually all got called to like an all hands meeting, and it was our president at the time pulled us together. We had decided to do the the treasury write off. We were announcing the capital raise, and there was a direction that you were going to follow this script. And they said, hey, it's a quiet period, we can't talk. You can you know, assure the, uh, your clients that we're all safe, and here's the PowerPoint deck to do that, and go ahead and stick to that script, and we can't really talk till the following week. So this, uh, this was on Thursday. This right? is Thursday morning, first thing in the morning. And everyone in that conference room looked at each other and we said, oh shit, we're probably not gonna be around till the next week. We're kind of left on our own to kind of defend our turf and do this kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat messaging. And so, you know, for all of us, we kind of left and, you know, we're in a relationship banking business. You know, everyone has our cell phone. Like every, most of these relationships just start calling us. I'd be on one phone call talking to a, a client. I'd miss 20 other phone calls. I'd get 20 missed text messages. I'd move on to the next one and do the same thing. And this was the same for for kind of every single colleague that, that we had. And there was no higher level guidance. We didn't really know what was going on. None of us had ever been part of a bank run. So we're trying our best. We kind of explain what's going on. And at the end of the conversation, we'd be like, but here's how you wire money out. Like, I'm not gonna stop you. I'm not gonna convince you that it's fine because I don't really know. At the end of Thursday, we had this thing at SUB where it would send out a, a notification of every wire that went out in the company of above a million dollars. I mean, it was a way for us to kind of keep tabs on like, hey, someone raised a round, like congrats and all that. In this case, you got to then see how much had gone out. And so you really didn't know because you were on these phone calls all day long trying to kind of field these, you know, help clients, help them learn what to do to realize what the magnitude was outside the whole bank. And so we then, you know, saw that $40 billion had gone out kind of in this Excel spreadsheet and we're like, oh, wow, what does that mean? That, that's not very good. Then similar thing happens all, the, all throughout kind of Friday, Friday afternoon. Friday afternoon, not a lot of people know this, but the, the FDIC took over and they sent an email to kind of every single employee at F SVB, said, you do not work at SVB anymore. You're welcome to work for the FDIC for 45 days. You're no longer allowed to talk to your clients. And that was the 26 out of offices that uh, the Rippling team got. And good luck. And that was it. And what was crazy for anyone that was involved in it is it went from incredibly loud for 48 hours, like very, very loud, just scary, and then quiet, and like very quiet. Like, you know, you weren't reaching out to anybody. You know, it was kind of, it was this like weird, eerie silence. And that's, to be honest for me personally, I think where it got scary, where you kind of thought, wow, what does this mean for me? I've worked here my whole entire career. Most of my relationships, you know, is venture banking done? Is SUV done? And so for me, uh, I left that. I had my son's four-year birthday party Saturday morning. So I hosted like 15 four-year-olds. We did the bouncy house, the cake, all that. And then kind of got done with it. And I just said, all right, like I need to take control of this. Like, I don't know what this means, but there could be like thousands of venture bankers without a job. Like a thousand of my friends that don't have, don't have a, a place to work. We need to find like the best home we possibly can. So I called up two of my peers at the time, uh, Jake Mosley and Ted Wilson, and just said, we need to take control of this. How do we, how do we find a home for a team? All of us had worked at SUB our whole career, and I'll tell you some of the stories like when we were, so I'll get into that of some of the silly things that we did, but one of the examples is we took one of these meetings with an executive on, on WhatsApp, and uh, my WhatsApp background, which I only use for like personal reasons, is a picture of me dressed up as a cookie monster, holding my daughter, also dressed up as a cookie monster, and so I'm on the phone with a CEO of a bank, like, you know, in, in this is my background, which was really, really smooth. But anyways, we, we met, and we kind of said, hey, let's, let's try to find you know, a handful of, of executive meetings with a number of banks, some big, some small, and let's see what happens over the next week and, and make this happen. So 
We went out and did that. So, yep. so you were already like that weekend, you were already like, okay, SVB is done, we're finding a new home, and the idea that the bank would kind of reemerge in a new form wasn't really on your radar? No, especially because we got the email that said we would no longer work there. So <laughs> over the weekend, they got taken out. That all changed on Monday. So, you know, they decided to keep the bank alive, decided to guarantee all deposits. But the motion kind of started that weekend after kind of that email. And so during that period of time, we met with a number of different groups. What came clear when we met with Stiefel, one, they really understood the opportunity. Like they got it. They knew how we could fit. They knew what we could do. And they were going to move quick. They were ready to work with us. And the other thing is we kind of came to the determination that that's actually a really good home for us to build. I um, mean, for us, there was a few things that like really resonated for us. Wait, so okay. if yeah. I could just stop you, I want to visit a couple other things yeah. from the crisis period first. So when you were in that meeting on, on Thursday morning and they said, well, we, because there's been a lot of criticism of the leadership for that, for that press release and for, you know, announcing a capital raise without the deal being closed. Were, were you sitting there saying, oh my God, like, what are you doing? Like, w w w was it sort of clear that, that a major blunder had been made here? I don't think we, like, fully understood all the reasoning, so we didn't uh, fully understand what was going on behind the scenes that made that decision. But I think the people on the ground who were gonna have to deal with the fallout from that knew that this was gonna be a really bad day, or a hard day. <laughs> um, I don't think at that moment I predicted a bank run. I just thought, you know, that's not a way you communicate with people of, hey, calm down, I'll talk to you in five days. Like, that, that, that was gonna be a hard message. And, and one last question on the, the sort of pre-crisis. So a couple of people earlier had mentioned that uh, signs were emerging even in January. People were kind of raising questions about the treasury investments and so forth. Did, did, did you have any rumblings of trouble before, before the crisis hit? Yeah, so it's interesting, the thing that caused the we didn't have a liquidity problem at SUB. We had maybe an ROE problem because we had locked up treasuries at an inopportune time, at an inopportune rate. What that meant or what we were feeling was more like we should have been booming. We had you know, floating rate loans. We were able to make a whole lot of our deposits. We should have been able to invest a ton of money in the business. And there was a little bit of a pressure to like not invest alongside with what we would assume to be a boom in revenue growth. Mm -hmm. And so it was more of a profitability problem as opposed to a liquidity problem that we knew about. But, you know, we, I think what ended up happening because of how that was handled sparked a bank run, which I'd be surprised if most kind of knew that was going to happen, especially like well in advance. But uh, I had, I was not aware that that could have been a result. <laughs> so moving to Stiefel, so, so Stiefel is not necessarily an obvious choice. I mean, it doesn't have a, a brand name here, really, that would seem significant, actually, in, in this kind of business. So uh, what was it that sort of made, made Stiefel an interesting choice? Uh, yeah. So, you know, when we were thinking of kind of where we wanted to end up, a couple things resonated with us. So first, Stiefel had already acquired I think 20 companies or 20 teams over the past 20 years, and like 19 of those 20 CEOs had stayed with the company still. And so they had a history of kind of acquiring teams and then getting out of the way and let you have your own brand. So they'd acquired Thomas Weisel, KBW, and they've been able to kind of support them, but they don't put the Stiefel brand first, they put kind of the people first. And so they allow you to kind of build within that infrastructure. One of my colleague or my co-workers who kind of came to this with us was very close with one of those CEOs, so he gave us that reference. The other thing I think we really liked is, you know, their ability to be nimble. So, like, even though, you know, we're starting and we're smaller, I'd competed against large banks my whole entire career, and they often have a hard time kind of wanting to really engage with early stage founders, wanting to really commit to the, the long, long sales cycle that it takes to be profitable off a a seed stage company or a series A company. Mm -hmm. And so I was, I purposely was preferring to go to kind of a smaller institution that side. And then they also had a really unique platform where they have a middle market investment bank and a wealth management team that mm -hmm. can kind of help a founder throughout the whole cycle of a dollar. So from foundation to all the way to IPO to planning for their family. And actually those groups are more tailored, you know, like our investment bank is number one in activity for a billion dollars in transactions and less. 
that's most of where, that's like, that's the majority of where venture bet companies end up. And mm -hmm. so as opposed to someone that's going way top market, um, which is maybe, you know, of a thousand company portfolio is like two companies, we're able to serve a lot more companies that we work with through that methodology. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned the, the serving the, the client from the earliest stages. Can, can you really do the full suite of things that, that SVB did in terms of both the personal relationships and the, you know, venture credit and all those things? Is, is it really the full stack, as it were, of those services? Yeah. So I think from an earlier stage, yes. So I think that what had also attracted us to move over to Stiefel is they've been doing venture banking since 2017. They deployed about $9 billion of debt capital in the industry. And, you know, when you're lending to cash flow negative companies, like that's a really, really unique thing, especially when there's no assets. And so to believe that a bank would jump in and be able to do that without proving it already was a bit of a leap too far for us. So the fact that they'd already done that, we felt really comfortable that they were going to be able to continue to lend. And that proved out. We were able to kind of hit the ground running, issue term sheets day one, and be, be working with kind of series A, early stage mm -hmm. companies from that side. And credit, I mean, credit's tighter now, right? It, it's a little, little less generous with those loans, right? I actually wouldn't describe it as tighter. I think it's more have and have nots, actually. I think that the fact that a number of, of similar-minded people have to a bunch of different competitors who are looking to grow. I actually think folks are pretty active, and it, it's, it is for, for companies that are either performing very well or are raising fresh capital. There's quite a bit of debt options kind of available. I think, you know, if you have companies that have significant overvaluation and are, it's pretty obvious they're not going to be able to raise or have a hard time raising, I think that's where, the, where it's much harder to raise and, or to bring on debt capital in general. But I still think the market's actually pretty active. Okay. And they, are the credit assessments uh, undertaken a similar way now? I mean, there was a comment earlier about the, the sort of the old school where you look in someone's eye and decide whether they're good for the debt or not, that those days are gone. It's all algorithmically determined. And so this idea of kind of relationship banking is a little bit less significant in a way than it used to be. Yeah. I don't believe that to be true. So I, I think I think in a lot of ways, like relationship banking is is still the way that we're all kind of going to market. And it also works really well in this, well, it in a lot of ways works well with this venture community because a handful of funds, Peter, I think mentioned they have like 270 portfolio companies, you know, you're able to build a relationship with a fund, within some entrepreneurs within those funds. It's a really easy way to kind of expand with you know, building deep relationships with a handful of funds to create a really big business. Obviously, that if it's a bank run, then that can disperse money very quickly, but it, that still works, and I think that's a lot of way, that's still the same way that most people are going to market today. And uh, we, we have time for one or two questions, if anyone has a question. Yeah, we've talked a lot this morning about this being a relationship business. I'm curious, like, what were some of those faults like to folks that you had a relationship with uh, before when you were able to talk to clients at SVB? Yeah, so when we're at SUB, I'd say it was just trying to be as transparent as possible. So I think we had a lot of uncertainty because we were given information and then and then we were just left to kind of fend off calls. And so it was a lot of explaining where we're at, where we are, what our balance sheet looks like, what the problem was. But at the end of the day, as I mentioned, just saying if you want to wire your money out, here you go. Like I'm not gonna tell you that you're for sure gonna be safe because unless you're in an insured suite product or a cash secured uh, a treasury product, it might not be. And so we kind of tried to just give them the best advice as possible. I will say that as we moved on and have, have now are talking to kind of prospects at the other place, I do think us picking up the phone, us being transparent in those moments, like did matter to those individuals. Um, and I think today, a lot of the relationships carry over and, and you know, folks are are open to kind of hearing the story and you know are are wanting they want a healthy ecosystem they're 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 not just choosing kind of one provider but they're they're kind of looking to continue to maintain relationships with a number of different banks would you say that a, you've been able to bring a significant amount of your prior business over to to Stiefel or your your previous relationships let's put it that way yeah so yes and no so uh, i'd say yes like we we've, we've had growth we're growing every month i think we've brought over over two and a half billion dollars of deposits, deployed about $1.5 billion of loans in the last year. So we've we've been able to grow and continue to grow there. A couple things are true. One, it's incredibly painful 
to move your banking. So like, you know, if you have incumbency, that's gonna be crucial. And also, you know, a lot of our relationships with SUB, our, our previous clients of SUB, SUB is still there and, and strong and showing up. And so, you know, we're, we're actually much better set kind of working with companies that have banking with someone that isn't really showing them much love at all. And so, so we've been able to grow, we're building a business, but uh, we also, given the market environment, don't wanna take undue risk. So wanna do that responsibly. Right. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you very much, Matt. Appreciate your being here. Awesome. Thank you.